Greetings. Welcome to Making African America, a virtual symposium on immigration and the changing dynamics of blackness. My name is Julie Green, and I'm the director of the Center for Global Migration Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. This conference is a collaboration between the Center for Global Migration Studies and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And joining me here in welcoming you is Joanne Hippolyte, the African Diaspora Curator at the museum. Thank you, Julie. This conference emerged after our understanding of the import, as a result of our understanding of the importance of African diasporic immigration to the United States over the last 150 years. From the Caribbean migrations of the late 19th and early 20th century to the more sweeping African, Latin American and Caribbean migrations since 1965, black immigrants have exercised a profound influence on the making of contemporary African America. They confront dual forms of racial injustice as people of African descent and as immigrants whose presence in the United States is often challenged. Today, nearly 10% of Black Americans are immigrants or the children of immigrants, and they and their children have played a distinctive role in the struggle for human rights and reshaped the experience of Blackness along the way. This conference will explore immigrants' experiences, their ongoing ties to their homes, their musical and literary forms of expression, their struggles for civil and labor rights, and their relationship with native-born African-Americans. The encounters between native-born African-Americans and Black immigrants have been powerful, leading both groups to new alliances, sometimes to new tensions and struggles, and always to new understandings of their own Blackness. Over the next three weeks, we will explore these issues with presentations by historians, curators, scholars, filmmakers, novelists, and activists. Now we turn to welcome comments from three leaders of our organizations. Kevin Young, the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Bonnie Thornton Dill, the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at the University of Maryland, and Lonnie Bunch, the Secretary of the Smithsonian. Hello, I'm Kevin Young, the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm honored to welcome you to this groundbreaking gathering on the impact of immigration on Black American identity co-sponsored with the Center for Global Migration Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. This symposium, Making African America, Immigration and the Changing Dynamics of Blackness, will explore how demographic changes have transformed the social, cultural, and political significance of Blackness in the United States. Having personally just completed editing an anthology of African American poetry spanning 250 years of struggle and song, I'm well aware of the ways that African-American identity was shaped by immigrants to this country. The Harlem Renaissance, for instance, would not be possible without immigrant energies and authors, not to mention any number of its artists becoming expatriates for a time. This gathering not only explores immigration and its impact on changing notions of Black identity in the United States, but celebrates the collaboration between UMD and the museum that has produced this innovative event. I want to first off thank the teams that helped organize this groundbreaking event and the 50 participants, scholars, journalists, activists, museum professionals, poets and novelists who have taken time from their work to share their insights. And thank you, our audience who have joined us for this welcome and keynote address and are able to register for any of the 11 subsequent sessions of the symposium. I'd like also to acknowledge the National Endowment for the Humanities, American Express, and the William R. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust for their support. I'd like to end by recognizing the importance of immigration as a force impacting Black life in America and remind you that at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we present Black American identity as multicultural and immigration as an important part of the Black American story. Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of the University of Maryland, 
and particularly the Center for Global Migration Studies in the College of Arts and Humanities. I'm pleased to join my colleagues, Kevin Young, the new director of the Smithsonian's National Museum for African American History and Culture, and Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie Bunch in welcoming you to the Making African America Symposium. This conference has been an aspirational vision for some time. I recall with fondness earlier conversations with Julie Green and our friend and colleague, the late Professor Emeritus Ira Berlin, as they described the conference they were planning in partnership with the museum. So it's exciting and timely to see it come to fruition. Timely because in the midst of this 21st century racial reckoning, it is important that we both reveal and understand the complexities and variations within the African American community at the same time that we call the nation to account for its anti-Black policies and practices. This is no small or insignificant feat. I can recall 20th century conversations in which immigration and African-American history and culture, particularly in popular discourse, were characterized as oppositional. Immigrants were said to have come by choice. African-Americans were brought here against their will. Comparing the two was frowned upon and descriptions of the nation as a nation of immigrants largely overlooked the migrations, both forced and selective of people from the African diaspora. Therefore, placing these two bodies of scholarship and thought, immigration studies and African-American history and culture in conversation will better help us all understand the African-American story and who constitutes the group of people we call African-American. Our differences, similarities, tensions and conflicts both in relationship to our places of origin, recent and distant, but also in relationship to the communities we're creating. In the College of Arts and Humanities, our aim is to produce students who are global visionaries and creative problem solvers. This conference reflects those values at the same time that it applies and enhances them. On the Maryland campus, a growing number of our Black students are the children of African and Caribbean immigrants. We therefore live the reality of a new understanding of what it means to be African American or Black American on a daily basis. That's another reason why I'm particularly appreciative of this gathering of researchers, scholars, journalists, and others. I expect that your time together will provide even greater insight into these global pathways and transitions, and that it will lead to the production of knowledge, yielding creative, collaborative approaches to this discourse. So I thank each of you for your presence and for contributing your scholarship and thought to this timely and important interdisciplinary conversation. Hello, and welcome to the Making African America Symposium. I'm Lonnie Bunch, the Secretary of the Smithsonian, and on behalf of the entire institution, let me say how excited we are to have you join us. The National Museum of African American History and Culture is thrilled to collaborate with the University of Maryland on this symposium. I want to start by recognizing my friend, the late Ira Berlin, whose influence shapes everything we do here. Ira was a distinguished university professor of history, and he was a founding co-director of the Center for Global Migration Studies at the University of Maryland. He was a prolific and transformational interpreter of African-American history. Through decades of scholarship, teaching, and publications, 
Ira changed the way we understand the institution of slavery and expanded our notions about race beyond black and white. In essence, we have all been students of Ira Berlin and we have all been made better by his scholarship and his vision. And as much as he shaped this professional field that I love, Ira left an indelible impression on me personally. He was one of the first people to reach out when I was announced as director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He immediately offered to help in any way he could. His work informed so many aspects of this museum. He pushed us to incorporate cutting edge research and engage audiences in difficult conversations. And he helped position the museum as a hub of scholarship and engagement. And his leadership was instrumental in developing and organizing the future of the African-American Past Symposia in 2016. I must admit, one of the great joys of living in Washington was going to dinner with Ira, sharing our ideas and challenges and testing out some new foods. I dearly miss those evenings with Ira and Martha. Bursts of laughter and thoughtful exchange, the pleasures of deep friendship. But although I mourn him, I'm comforted knowing that his spirit and influence will be felt by all joining us in the Making African America Symposium. Candidly, the events of the past year have brought the black experience to the center of American discourse in ways that I hadn't seen before. And the question of what it means to be African-American is as alive and urgent today as it's ever been in this country. In the past 30 years, more Africans have come to the United States than during the entire slave trade. So we need to be asking harder questions about what it means to be African-American. Though slavery continues to shape the experience of blackness in America, continues to inform the American spirit. We cannot define the African-American community as one that is exclusively descendant from enslaved. Black identity is not monolithic. It branches and builds, brings together different backgrounds, experiences, and hopes. It grows more vibrant and nuanced with every new voice. Studying immigration helps us understand the challenges and opportunities that these changes bring. Community identity complex notions of home and belonging, the geography and demography of civil rights. Studying immigration also helps us explore the underlying tensions within Black communities, bringing to the fore radically different perspectives on identity, history, and culture. I've seen these frictions play out in my own neighborhood. We're home to a popular Ethiopian church that serves DC's growing Ethiopian community. And many of the older African-American families get upset about who are these newcomers coming in, taking our parking spaces. Now, this might seem like a minor example, but it's indicative of a larger challenge, the challenge of opening up space within the African-American identity to support dynamic and changing demographics, to include differences across background, across language, across experience. And what do the shifting dynamics of Black identity mean to our communities and our country going forward? How do we need to reframe our understanding of Blackness to include the effects of migration? With the exception of indigenous people who populated this land before our ancestors' arrival, we are a nation of immigrants, Black immigrants from the Caribbean, Latin America, and Africa have profoundly influenced the making of African America. And just as the history of immigration is the history of the African-American, so too will be the changing demographics of this decade, and it will help to determine our future. That's why a symposium like this one is so important. It brings together creative scholars across many fields, backgrounds, and interests who want to understand how the African-American identity has changed. They want to explore all the diversity and richness and dynamism within this community. The participants of this symposium will delve into vitally important questions around social, cultural, and political transformation. I am happy to say that any answers we come up with 
will in some ways be incomplete because blackness will continue to grow, transform, and evolve. Our exploration today necessarily looks different from conversations we'll have in the future, in future years, in future decades. I expect that our children and our grandchildren will inhabit questions and continue to explore what it means to be African Americans in ways we can't anticipate right now. In this way, the making of African America Symposium is part of an ongoing dialogue that stretches across generations. And just as our discussions in this moment grow out of a past decades of research, of scholarship and debate, it is my hope that this symposium will help set the groundwork for future generations to understand themselves and their communities more fully. Let me thank all those who works and support have made this event possible. Teams at the African American Museum at the University of Maryland, our partners at American Express, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the William F. Keenan Jr. Charitable Trust, to all the participants of this symposium, to all who have supported it, to all who are building on the work of Ira Berlin, thank you. And I look forward to hearing your wisdom, your scholarship, and your understanding of who we once were and who we can become. Thank you and enjoy the rest of Making Africa America. Thank you so much to Kevin Young, Bonnie Thornton Dill, and Lonnie Bunch for those stirring comments. I, I know that the initial idea for this entire project came out of conversations between Lonnie Bunch and Ira Berlin, and uh, so we very much uh, feel Ira's spirit with us throughout our work on this. So thank you very much. I am thrilled now to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Carol Boyce Davies, who will launch our symposium with an address titled Dislocations, Dispossessions on Borders, Walls, and Nations. Professor Davies' work has long been an inspiration to me, and so um, I'm really excited that she's kicking things off for us today. Carol Boyce Davies is the Frank H. T. Rhodes Professor of Humane Letters in the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Africana Studies and English at Cornell University. She has held distinguished professorships at a number of institutions, including the Herskovitz Professor of African Studies and Professor of Comparative Literary Studies and African American Studies at Northwestern University. She's the author of Black Women, Writing and Identity, Migrations of the Subject, and also Left of Karl Marx, The Political Life of Black Communist Claudia Jones. In addition to numerous scholarly articles, uh, in addition to numerous scholarly articles, Boyce Davies has also published several critical anthologies. Nambika, Studies of Women in African Literature, Out of the Kumla, Caribbean Women and Literature, a two-volume collection of critical and creative writing entitled Moving Beyond Boundaries, International Dimensions of Black Women's Writing, and Black Women's Diasporas, Volumes 1 and 2. She is co-editor with Ali Mazrui and Isidore Opewo of the African Diaspora, African Origins and New World Identities, and Decolonizing the Academy, African Diaspora Studies. She's general editor of the three-volume The Encyclopedia of the African Diaspora, and of Claudia Jones, Beyond Containment, Autobiography, Essays, and Poetry. Her most recent monograph is Caribbean Spaces, Escape Routes from Twilight Zones, Illinois, 2013, and a children's book titled Walking. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Davies. <laughs> 
Hi, everybody. I am so pleased to be here. And thank you for that lovely introduction, Julie. Um, it's a pleasure doing anything that advances um, the work we do, um, and in particular working uh, with the National Museum of African American History and Culture and my colleagues at the University of Maryland. I feel really at home and I'm honored to have been asked to do this. So thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to be the keynote speaker for this conference, Making African America on Immigration and the Changing Dynamics of Blackness, organized in collaboration between the Center for Global American History and Culture and the National Museum. It is quite an honor and one wonders if it is longevity or that maybe I have had some things to say that people find useful. Hopefully the latter, as in one of the promotional events for this event, it is noted that we are starting off with me talking about diaspora. So I guess that's um, where I enter, right? Perhaps a bit of self-protective disclosure is warranted as when this invitation was offered about two years ago, the expectation was an in-person encounter with flights already made and all of that. Even the suggested title was operating in a context in which I was writing about discussions of walls and borders and they were therefore prominent in my head, therefore the, that title that you see indicated there. Um, but basically um, it, at that time, the question of walls and borders were really nationally presented uh, representations of how the United States was positioning itself uh, during the last presidency. Uh, in the postponements though, following the pandemic and in the new format in which we are now working via a virtual keynote and the model which the symposium uses, the lessons from using uh, Zoom via teaching is that we always wary of Zoom fatigue on both sides, the listener and the speaker. So I will keep it short. To our discussion though, a few orienting questions are validly indicated as guiding principles as it were. One, how does one represent a US-based domestic identification as African-American while simultaneously accounting for global African-American communities? especially since the majority of Africans were taken, actually, to Central and South America, producing their also large African-American communities, and especially since the U.S. African-Americans also exist as well in that large African diaspora. Two, how do those entering the U.S. space represent and acknowledge the fact that U.S. African-Americans in each generation have to cons consistently claim a certain primary belonging which continuously gets eroded, advanced more than, uh, sometimes more than others, but consistently in a process of claiming that belonging. How do US African-Americans who are descendants of those enslaved in the US at the first level, avoid the ugliness of nativism that one sees graphically represented in white supremacist discourses, recognizing also the movements already embedded in some of these migrations during and immediately after enslavement in the Americas, suggesting that people did not just come and stay in one place, but there was constant movement all along. And then finally, how have some of our thinkers engage these issues of black subjectivity from their own vantage points and locations in both a local and a global context. I entered this discussion then as a Caribbean American subject working in and out of the North American Academy and with both lived experience and actual intellectual work in the African diaspora broadly defined. And I, I need to say constantly that it's a process of always adding to one's knowledge base that it's never complete because uh, as Aswad argues, when you study the African diaspora, you're actually studying the world. So it's the three opening epigraphs which begin this presentation. One of them is from Fanon, and this is just to talk about dislocation and displacement um, in the ways that theoretically um, we see it operating in, in some of the thinkers around this question. Fanon, one on that day, completely dislocated, unable to be abroad with the other, the white man who unmercifully imprisoned me, I took myself far off from my own presence, far indeed, and made myself an object. Stuart Hall, my relationship to the Caribbean was one of dislocation, of displacement, literally or figuratively. And Jamaica Kincaid, I'm in a state of constant discomfort. And I like this state so much, I would like to share it. While these three epigraphs capture various forms of personal displacement and dislocation, 
They emanate from larger forms of domination in which various contemporary human actors are left to determine and identify the causes of these displacements. In the first is that Fanonian confrontation with white male supremacy, which dislocates the black male subject that he is representing here with a variety of responses that he develops in the process. For those of you who read, who've read that lived experience of blackness piece, you would of course know all the moves he makes for that black subject there. But here he poses at this, this, the psychological degradation, degradation at the personal male gendered level of that black subject. The second emanating from Stuart Hall then sees this dislocation and displacement both at home and in the center of empire. And then finally, Kincaid's assumption of perpetual discomfort, still a kind of nervous condition, as Tsitsi Dangaremba would call that colonial and post-colonial condition. But in Kincaid's case, a desire not to make the outcomes of that displacement applicable to herself, but the desire to make this discomfort perhaps a perpetual instability, part of the normatives of Black experience. There's a relationship then between these personal senses of psychic dislocation, which are already built in perhaps into what is called the modern condition and from which we benefit or suffer accordingly. But these, in my view, we encounter an incomplete abolitionist or emancipatory project reenacted or revisioned in the wake of globalization of the globalization of the Black Lives Matter movements on the one hand, and the ongoing abolitionist paradigms advance intellectually to contest what we recognize as the global carceral state, which we know argues the continuing enslavement of black populations. Ronaldo Walcott in his recent On Property describes abolition as an unfinished project in much the same way as emancipation, both the United States and hemispheric was indicated by thinkers like Frederick Douglass as relational and continuing. The need then to reread the discourses of black freedom relationally is expressed well in that Douglas 1857 West Indian emancipation speech as one of quote, living in the United States, but living in the world. In other words, the caution against limiting one's actions and understandings only to the country in which one happens to be born or the nation or community of which he forms a small part becomes a question of that contradiction that he hopes to avoid. So here Douglas instead offers a simultaneity of thinking of these two intersecting relationships. So my own relationship then to discourses of migration begins as an intellectual journey which pursues these references in literature, identif identifying migration as a key trope in rep representative literatures, particularly from the Caribbean, particularly from the Caribbean for whom Mobility is identified as fundamental to self-definition. In other words, Caribbean identity is linked often with this question of mobility. This internal, I should say, intra-Caribbean and extra as well, right? So this converges with a secondary interest, my own secondary interest in international human rights law, in which stark realities of theoretical migration converge with the actual lived experience. And what follows then, I invite you to think through with me some of these key themes that I see as prescient as we approach the primary theme of this conference, Making African America. But let us start at the very beginning. It begins then with an assertion that even as one makes claims then for belonging, and I'm talking about black subjects wherever we are, or being dislocated, there has to be a recognition of a primary dispossession which created the Americas. Recently, Cornell University, where I work, had to come to terms uh, admirably, I think, with the findings that its endowment was among the highest acquired through indigenous dispossession, necessitating a statement which now introduces most public events, right? I'll read it. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayagohono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayagohono are members of the Haudenosaunee, Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaigohono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaigohono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. All of the languages in there, right? Dispossession, 
Cornell, the institution, the state, the United States of America. We witnessed then in real time the results of this first level of dispossession, which all other dislocations in the Americas rest on. In other words, the range of settler colonial nations which are founded in, this, in the wake then of this dispossession. But let us be clear though, that this is not specific to Cornell at all. As research indicates, all contemporary American nation states already operate on the assumption of this dispossession. The entire contemporary Caribbean, for example, uh, ex uh, exposes a renaming of all the contemporary nations which operate on the basis of this possession. An indigenous mapping of the Caribbean reveals the rapid execution of the prerogative to rename everything which became the hallmark of European modernity. So for this presentation then, I want to provide an engagement from a variety of intersecting positions with the nature of dispossessions and dislocations as theoretical and actual reality in the making of African America, the theme of this conference. But for me, one comes up sharply in the framing of such a conference as making African America as to what this America is that is defined. Having done some of the thinking already on this and some of it available in my first uh, book, Migrations of the Subject, the term African-American refers as well to African peoples across the Americas, North, Central Caribbean and South, with all the contentious and conflicted meanings suddenly launched even with my making that assertion. In my understanding of that term then is an assumed hemispheric reading, realizing that this is not automatically the spatial configuration, which most of us, even in this intellectual community, listening community, that is some of you operate. Indeed, the domestic hegemonic definition of United States of America is the one that is marketed both domestically and internationally as the equivalence of what is America. Yet they have always been continuous and continuing definitions throughout that same 20th century history from Marty onwards, constantly contesting that simultaneous tendency to dominance that the US operates with, even at the level of naming as of ideological practice. In Americanity as a concept or the Americas in the modern world system, Anibal Kihanu and Emmanuel Wallerstein begin by asserting that, quote, the creation of this geosocial entity, the Americas, was the constitutive act of the modern world system, unquote. Thus, quote, all the states in this sense, thus, quote, all the boundaries were new. But significantly, the boundaries of these states have constantly changed over the centuries. Thus, we have to be clear then that what we define today as fixed borders, and we're thinking about the way the US positions migrating subjects coming into the US from different points, particularly points south, that all of these, what is defined as fixed borders, even in the United States context, were colonial creations or acquisitions and extensions with a series of promised benefits for those inside the boundaries of this nation state, but also with simultaneous exclusions. And there are entire fields of Afro-Latin American studies or Caribbean studies, which provide completely different and alternative understandings of this conceptual American understanding. Thus, in the interest of finding alternative languaging of this reality and challenging the North-South context of knowledge transmission, we may want to also re-engage Lilia Gonzalez's definition of Americanidaji, Americanity, which describes the experiences of Africans in the Americans, names the continuity of Black experience across the Americas. Quote, a historic of process of intense cultural dynamic, resistance, accommodation, reinterpretation, creation of new forms, reference in African models, shape the construction of ethnic identity. I want to also suggest that Sylvia Winter's initial call for the re-examination of Afro-indigeneity provides the space in which Lelia Gonzalez's concept can fully reside. And I want to thank here Keisha Kant Perry and Thais Santana uh, for their translation of Lelia Gonzalez's 1979 classic, The Black Woman of Portrait, uh, which I would recommend that you take a look at. I want to assert nonetheless the necessity of reading simultaneously the local and global relationships. As Douglas suggests, or as Du Bois also describes it, 
or even as David Walker termed it in his appeal to the colored citizens of the world. Thus, the domestic US African American narrative comes forward in my understanding, informed by a successive wave of migrations, not limited to enslavement only, but prior to and after and in relation to all of those encounters. In this regard, the Ira Berlin argument, which I was pleased to look at again of the four migratory movements have renewed significance. So basically in the rest of the presentation, what I do, and, and I will just go through um, them briefly, is talk about a few key points, right? So first of all, the question of, of borders, walls, and nations, which I started which, uh, with, I need to uh, acknowledge um, is part of the thinking of two scholars from uh, Martinique, Miriam Moise and Fred Reno, and I know Miriam is listening, hi Miriam, uh, who recently published a book, Border Transgression and Reconfiguration of Caribbean Spaces, Palgrave 2020, which describes and interrogates the nature of the border, usually perceived in terms of separation. Yeah, was look at the Caribbean example then of how we think of the borders, right? So that logically, in the thinking of a landed space, we know that states are able to fix borders in very specific ways. But what happens when you're talking about the sea as the border? Or what happens when you have the transgression of those same borders uh, in a number of ways by military might and so on, right? As happened with Columbus uh, entering the Americas and renaming uh, Haiti or Kiskeya to Hispaniola. But we realize as well, if we follow Edwidge Nandicat's early really wonderful discussion of this in her book called Anna Kaona, that we also had a series of these movements of, of indigenous peoples, Tainos, Caribs, and Arawaks, who also did all kinds of movements around the Caribbean. And then of course, as in my work and in this work as well, the Circum Caribbean with landed borders and so on becomes really fundamental. So even then, as we know, the idea of the nation is a recent invention and that sovereignty for sure um, it still turns on the idea of boundaries, even when they're not physically present, as in built walls and so on. We know that these physical walls mirror the political logic of separate and discrete national identities, uh, dominant and subordinate relationships, often leaning towards the ethnocentric and the xenophobic relationships that one saw in the last administrative um, government of the United States. Indeed, what are considered borders throughout the Caribbean, throughout Africa, for sure, reflect the largely colonial operations of European powers, French, Spanish, English, Dutch, which established ownership of these lands, deemed them terra nullis, meaning empty or unknown land, in order to justify control. In this framework, then indigenous peoples had to be redefined as non-persons or redefined outside of humanity. So that's in my work in Caribbean spaces, for example, I was deliberate about trying to find ways to redefine ontologically the meaning of that space, challenging the imposed boundaries of islands, coloniality, and limited geographies, and looking also at the sociocultural relationships which create communities in the, in the North American context, but also South and Central America, definitely across Europe as well. The project was to challenge then the thinking which limited us to always seeing ourselves in terms of small fragmented island geographies and moving beyond all of those um, ways that we get limited in terms of time and space. So basically uh, in the rest of the presentation, uh, what I would do is just touch on a few things. So I began in my own work to talk about this as a kind of migratory subjectivity born out of my own family's experience and trying to make sense of a series of movements that I witnessed uh, in the Caribbean communities that we talked about earlier. I should uh, let you know though, that the initial title of the book was Migrations of the Subject. When it got uh, published at Routledge, they decided to use black women writing an identity as the lead. And the logic was that it, they did not want it to be stuck in migration studies um, um, libraries, but that they wanted it to be more fluent, I guess, with the, at, at that time, the discussion that had to do more with black women's writings. But in that theoretical contributions, for me, the discourses of subjectivity, which were dominant then, meant that it was easy to argue for a migratory subject that moved or that had capability or migratory capability depending on a range of factors, right? Age, race, place, geography, and so on. I pursue this in a number of ways in that text, if you were 
familiar with it or if you have not, then you may want to go back and look at it. But I was even more recently fascinated by finding a telling example of that whole question of that Caribbean migratory subject uh, in Black Power Pan-Africanist activist Tokli Michael Kwame Ture, who narrated a family history of inter-Caribbean migration on both ends, also producing a series of movements around the Caribbean and then to the United States. And then he, of course, ends in Guinea, West Africa deliberately, but not without a series of those diasporic circulations. So more deliberately in his narrative is an awareness of the intersecting or overlapping diaspora. He says when he goes to Mississippi, it felt like home. When he goes to Guinea, it also felt like home. The assumption of a series of homes then is what he suggests for the Caribbean diasporic activists. Caribbean identity, according to Dion Brand, has to be already ready for continuous reinvention. So I look, therefore, after that at the question of dislocation, re-diasporization, and circulation, actually looking at the way that Stuart Hall talks about the fact that we're not just diasporized in one move, but that we're doubly, sometimes triply diasporized. And this actually got even more um, definite in my thinking, looking at the work on Claudia Jones, who moves from Trinidad, moves to Harlem, and then moves to London. Uh, and in, in a way it becomes that representation of the doubly, triply diasporized subject. Uh, for Stuart Hall then, this double dislocation is part of that condition. And he says, interestingly, we were the forerunners. And I found that a really interesting framing because he seems to suggest that Caribbeans who did those migrations, either the long migration or the subsequent migration, ended up being the people who created some of these movements and paradigms, which many others follow. And then finally, um, the last frame I wanted to look at using the Jamaica kink, it was this question of deterritorialization and discomfort. And there I was closer to looking at the kind of languaging that comes out of UN agencies, which talk about and give you statistical evidence for the various migrations. And I should say that I come to this actually from going to Geneva at the UN headquarters there to give a talk on diaspora and then in the in the lobby, in the lower lobby of the of the building where I was doing my presentation, was an amazing array of organizations and interests which were showing uh, the the full scope of displacement and deterritorialization which had taken place across the world, uh, leading now to like a seventy nine point five million level of people who are internally displaced from Palestinians, Venezuelans, and so on. So basically, then struggles for race, class gender, all of these things, according to Sylvia Winter, in her unsettling the col coloniality of being power, truth, and freedom, a part of a systematic pattern to claim our humanity in the face of Western ethno-class bourgeois man who claims humanity for himself and leaves us constantly having to reassert ours. In all of these contexts, then, deterritorialization refers to that form of dispossession which moves one away from one's space and then pushes one towards a different location, finding refuge, whether it's due to climate, military conflicts, drug wars, encroachment of land on others, and a whole host of environmental issues which lead to various climate disasters. And therefore, this uh, ongoing question of marginalization and dispossession, which we see as part of the modern reality. So in conclusion then, migration studies reveal that none of these epic flows of people which create displacements and diasporas are accidental, but are all related to larger forces like the destruction of indigenous peoples and relegating them to reservations, enslavement of Africans, which created the initial transatlantic, transpacific and Indian Ocean traffic, and which also created the conditions for Europe and America's capitalist expansion, colonialism and neocolonialism and underdevelopment. In the Mediterranean, though, one sees a series of inferences, interferences from the West, invasions, wars, the quest for more fossil fuels, leading to perpetual conflicts in several locations. And we have so many examples. I mean, Libya is just one, but Iraq is another one. Uh, there are so many versions that one sees operating. Still, we see as well that there's an actuality to this immigration pattern, legislations often which create the push and pull of transnational labor and migration flows. At the same time, we observe the intellectual, cultural, and political linkages, 
which we make as human beings in a quest for a better life. So how do we move rapidly for me in my own case, as I did at, after being in that United Nations building, um, UNHCR, um, observe, observing the, the display, how do we move rapidly then from academic luxury of simply theorizing displacement as we attempt to understand how our writers and artists represent actual experience of migration and displacement, which directly runs into the largest statistical evidence of displacement and dislocation as real time human rights events. Thus Jamaica Kincaid's, I am in a state of constant discomfort and I like this state so much, I would like to share it. But here then is another version from a writer from Zimbabwe from her book, We Need New Names, which offers in the middle of that book, of that text, a meditation on why they left. Look at them leaving in droves, despite knowing they will be welcomed with restraint in those strange lands because they do not belong. Knowing they will have to sit on one buttock because they must not sit comfortably, lest they may be asked to rise and leave knowing they will speak in dampened whispers because they must not let their voices drown those of the owners of the land, knowing they will have to walk on their toes because they must not leave footprints on the new earth, lest they may be mistaken for those who want to claim the land as theirs. Look at them leaving in droves, arm in arm with loss and lost. Look at them leaving in droves. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Davies. That was such a um, poetic and evocative talk and powerful in the many different themes that you've raised. So now um, it's time for, uh, I know that Professor Davies is ready to take some questions from the audience, and there's a lot to um, to unpack and digest there. Um, so let me start with this, a question from an audience member named Jasmine, who notes that some people have been identifying as uh, mm -hmm. American descendants of slavery or foundational Black American. Could you situate those identities in relation to recent waves of immigrants from Africa and the Caribbean? Yeah, I um, I would say that it has to do more with this, for one to make that claim, which is a nativist claim, right? Um, then it has to do more with a sense of feeling dispossessed, not feeling that one has the full range of benefits of the state. And I think that is where I would want to put that answer and that question because it, the looking then to subsequent people who are migrating or claiming that there's a unified and fixed African descendants of slavery in the United States does not really comport with the um, historical evidence. For example, and I talked about this recently, and if Sharon Halley, if you're looking at this event, a big uh, shout out to you as well. But in uh, talking about this recently, Barbados, um, for example, um, for a while, um, and particularly the founding of Charles, the state of Charleston operated with the idea of, of enslaved um, Africans being brought by planters to the United States. And this is when Charleston is founded, right? In 1787 or something like that. So essentially you've had a series of movements consistently. So while I understand and, fig and I understand the logic or the impetus for that kind of claim, I think it freezes uh, uh, African-American identity in the context of enslavement largely and does not allow a certain other kind of understanding of movements. And then it also has to do with a, an avoidance of the fact that uh, that the question of, of from the dominant culture is that any subsequent mi person migrating is an imposition, is trying to take away from one's benefits and so on. So it's the logic of the, the pie being um, cut really small and therefore, how does one get a piece of that? And I think that's what's trying to be articulated there. And I understand their point, but uh, but it's coming from a sense of feeling dispossessed and not able to benefit fully from all the benefits of the state. Thank you. You raised so many issues about dislocation and dispossession. And there's a, a question from the audience that 
links up with something I was wondering too. The audience member says, if, if homeland is location, is migration necessarily dislocation? And that, that raises, the way I put the question was, you have such a focus here on dislocation and dispossession, but how do we get then to possession as black right. immigrants spend more time in the US? How does that process work? Right, I think it's a constant um, in my reading of, of both the Caribbean versions of that. Keep in mind that you would have similar arguments within the Caribbean itself where people um, look at other people coming from other locations as also taking away something. So that is not a new framing. Um, but I think re finding ways to reconfigure and, and redefine identity and repossess, I think is an ongoing process and it's done through uh, the, the logic that Winter uses, the question of indigeneity. For her, the point is that we indigenize in those landscapes by putting our stories in there, by operating in ways that we work with the land, the ways that we claim various um, relationships to, to community and so on, as opposed to exploiting or, or destroying the environment. So I think there's a really important point that can be made with the, the care and nurturing of the environment or the landscape and this question of repossession without therefore always pushing somebody else off from being able to um, operate in a particular space. Do you think that diaspora itself is part of that process of not only experiencing dispossession, but also possessing the new um, land? I see it as um, diaspora is a kind of another imagined community, but it's a collaborative way of sort of trying to gather, as, uh, I think Sheila Walker's logic, to, re, um, to gather the pieces of the various Africans who have been scattered. Uh, so then basically finding ways to create a new imaginary, a new way then that activates, but sometimes actualizing it as one sees uh, in various attempts, uh, various uh, attempts to have communication systems of movement that return one or people physically moving in different directions. But I tend to not look at diaspora and only in that logic of a way and return, but more the question of circulation, the way that we live and move in different locations and are able then to live in a life that, that is bountiful and relevant and is able to engage um, experiences as we encounter them. So, you know, a number of poets, um, I remember Grace Nichols had a a poem in which she said, wherever I hang my knickers, that's home. And I, I, I see her as also somebody who has been provocative about talking about where is home and how do we identify home. And keep in mind, home is not flattened or, or it's always positive, always um, accessible and so on. Edwidge writes really well about this question. And I'm so pleased to see her on the program later in yeah. the month, yes. Yeah, I agree. She's very powerful on these questions. Um, a slight shift, one, one of the questions I see here, could you say more about the relationship between uh, African-Americans, African immigrants and indigenous communities? Wow, I, you know, I'm not, I, I try to be um, really clear about what I know. I have not studied this sufficiently and I need to. Uh, particularly as it relates to indigenous communities, but I carry a great deal of respect all the time, um, in particular knowing the ways in which these systems operated, as I indicated, across the Caribbean. So um, I, I, when I encountered one of my, fa one of my father's relatives on, in in his um, family lineage, I discovered that his family is both Carib and African. So essentially many of us are walking around with a, very, a series of combination of these identities that are never spoken and never given space. Uh, and therefore the indigenous identities kept, uh, get, kept being frozen into some sort of location that is away from us when it's actually part of us as well without us, without us knowing it sometimes. So I think this is an area, this is what Sylvia Winter was saying, that when we worked with, when the, the logic of creolization became dominant and was the frame that people used a lot, that it elided another debate about indigeneity. And in my view, the work that is coming forward now, like the Black Shows by Tiffany Lethabu King and others, that is beginning to look at this question even more closely. And to me, that would be,
an area of, of further development. One of my colleagues at Cornell as well, um, Tauli Goff is also somebody who has done work in this area and particularly working in an institution that is upstate New York, where you still have all of those visible markers of, of dispossession that you, you cannot drive through upstate New York without seeing that or the Grand Railroad site. So the coming together of those two, those two encounters to me is so powerful that demands a great deal more work and, and relates of course to other kinds of ways of approaching this uh, from in different locations and from different points of view. That's interesting. Uh, here's a really related question, which I don't know if you have more to say on, but from AA in the chat says, uh, since you were talking about the process by which uh, immigrants repossess their new land, what does repossession look like in the era of the indigenous land back movement? Is repossession necessarily problematic then? Well, I, I think the question, I, I haven't followed this movement substantially, so I can't answer it fully in a way, and I'm sure the person AA, who is posing it has better answers than I do. Um, but the way that I was using this question of owning repossession is more like own, owning of one space or claiming one space. So, okay, basically Cornell then, as I used in the example at the start, um, operates on the basis of this dispossession that was already in place. Now, how do we reconfigure it so that people who would were removed from those encounters then have an opportunity to be able then to participate again without feeling further marginalized? And I, I think that's where the thinking has to go. And I cannot claim to have all of those answers, but I think these are questions that a series of other thinkers in all kinds of fields really have to engage in a in a really a substantive way. For example, they are creating at Cornell an anti-racist institute and in that the logic of how one reworks these questions was part of the discussion in an ongoing basis. So it, it, the question of anti-racism, which often turns only on the U.S. African-American experience um, or sometimes on the experiences of other people of color, often does not even engage the question of indigenous people's dispossession. And I think that's where we still need to do that kind of work um, for any kind of repossession, if you will. But I, I don't think indigenous peoples felt, and Africans didn't as well, that they wanted to own the land in the way that Europeans did for profit and, and for property, property as um, Ronaldo Walcott uses it in his work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You used the quote, I think it was from Douglas, that um, about a, a dual experience of living in the US and living in the world. Was that Douglas? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a beautiful image. And so a question from the audience is, could you say a bit more about those dual experiences? You know, I, I have to thank my colleagues um, at Cornell, Derek Spires in particular, because he invited us to do a forum on Douglas. And to do it, I discovered that often with Douglas, I was teaching Douglas's narrative at the time, one discovers that you spend a, a lot of time on the narrative um, and probably what to the sleep is the 4th of July, right? But then there's several other essays that and speeches of speeches that Douglas gave that are so critically important and that really define him as a global thinker. Definitely his, his speech on Haiti is a classic. And that's one that I refer to where he talks about that. And definitely this piece on the West India Federation, I'm sorry, West Indian Emancipation. Federation is a, is a natural slip there. But West Indian uh, Emancipation, 1857, where he actually talks about, similarly in the ways that CLR James will do it later, talks about the ways in which um, it's the self-motivation and the, the actions of the enslaved pushing back against slavery, which created that emancipatory movement and how dangerous it was that in spite of the fact of, of what took place in the United States, people still were not allowed then to, to move freely at the time that he was writing this, 1857. So literally 10 years before the US eventually does have emancipation. I keep saying, though, that the emancipatory process took the entire century. If we begin with the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1801, and then moving all to 1804, sorry, and then moving all the way forward into, you know, the Caribbean, the Anglophone 
Caribbean, emancipation, the Francophone, Hispanophone, all the way to Brazil. It took some, takes an entire century. And according to some thinking, we're still in that process. We're still trying to find ways, uh, particularly around questions of policing and so on, to look at how emancipatory practices still need to be um, um, pursued in order to handle the ways in which the state still polices and treats people, whether we're talking about the United States, Nigeria, Senegal, wherever. Uh, the question of the ways in which the state polices is very fundamentally part of those older processes of enslavement, the research shows. So I think um, that's as much as I want to say about that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It connects to several different things you talked about, including I, I thought your use of the phrase the global carceral state was very useful and also the ways in which you talk about emancipation as unfinished and as a continuing struggle. Um, abolition for sure. The, the, the new work on abolitionist discourses do really allow us to really talk more fully about some of those questions. Yeah. Here's a, a different sort of question about religion from Ricky Williams in the audience. How did religion play a part of this whole notion of dominance and subjection, sub, excuse me, subjugation, as well as migration? That's a uh, kind of a nice question. Um, and I'm, I think people must be looking at the Henry Louis Gates Black Church uh, PBS um, documentaries because religion works both on both ways. Douglas is really good at, talk, at talking about how formalized religion was accompanying oppression, uh, whether it's physical abuses or justifying torture and treat, mistreatment of enslaved peoples and so on. But at the same time, we know that it's also used for in liberatory ways, um, uh, this, you know, in, in ways that allow people to, to find moments of trans, you know, transformation or communities of transformation or ways of thinking outside of enslavement and so on. So I, I see it, this is one of those things that carries within the framing, the, the deliberate sort of oppositional intent or meaning of what religions do from the heavily horrible fundamentalist ways that it can be activated uh, or linked with white supremacy as it is in the United States often um, uh, to the other ways in which one uses it for freedom as King and others have done. Even Cornel West, in spite of his mistreatment from these institutions, still calls everybody brother, brother, my brother, my sister. Interesting, yeah. You mentioned, here's a question from the audience. You mentioned several institutions that shape the experience of the diaspora, for example, the state, the military, um, colonial authorities. Could you say more about culture and the ways that shapes both identity and the diaspora? I love that question. That is such a lovely question. Largely, and, and you know where I'm going to go with that, right? Those of you who know my work, because the, the way that Claudia Jones uses culture um, is, is writ large in her creation of the first London Carnival, where she uses that phrase, right? A people's art is the genesis of their freedom, which has been used, and I know several other art exhibitions and other ways of thinking about culture. So I think that question allows us to, to look at the ways that people talked earlier. Somebody had a question earlier about repossession. That's one of the ways that we repossess, not so that we redefine. Um, and we can take that all the way back to that distinction that Winter makes between the provision grounds where we learn to create the things that feed us or the, the ways that the Martinicans and the Guadalupians create the Creole garden where you have that balance. Uh, but the, the ways in which we create the, the foods that are gonna nurture and serve us as opposed to the plantation economies which use the land for oppressive means and so on. So culture in its broad meaning, of course, not just in the social cultural performances, but the recreation of those wherever we are. And to me, that is the strength of diaspora. That's why we love carnival. That's why we miss Juve uh, under pandemic um, orders. And that's why we see ways that we can then find to redefine and recreate ourselves wherever we are. There was a really wonderful interview that, um, my colleague, former colleague, um, uh, not, well, yeah, former colleague, Molara Gundipe did with 
Paula Marshall, which is called Recreating Ourselves All Over the World. And that's the title of the, of the, it was an interview. And it's published in that book that uh, Dr. Green mentioned, Moving Beyond Boundaries. But in there, Marshall talks about the fact that all over the world, wherever we are, we are in that process of recreation, recreating ourselves. And in my own thinking too, in, in looking at the question of space, we are also in that process of recreating our spaces, recreating our landscapes, creating other kinds of maroon environments, creating languages that we can um, redefine who we are. And I should also give a shout out to my colleague, Angelique Nixon. We recently did a small sampling of Caribbean global movements where we had a lovely piece by Attila Springer called it the Universal Declaration of Marinage. So look for that because she talks about this question of creating that space of freedom in spite of, of the various ways in which the state attempts to dominate. Thank you. Dee in the audience asks, what can we do in the US to build relationships and to find kindred spirits with Africans who are many of our neighbors in our communities? She says she feels more connected with those from the Caribbean. Something about what you were saying froze, Julie, so I missed the first part of your question. D in the audience asked, what can we do in the US to build relationships and find kindred spirits with Africans who are many of our neighbors in our communities? Wow, I that's a, a difficult one for a number of reasons. Often to me, those relationships, they cannot be one-sided, they have to be mutual um, and they have to work in, in a way that in which one has um, a certain interchange that is consistent. And some people prefer, it seems, to um, live lives where they're not necessarily always in communication with other people. And then again, there are communities of people who are consistently wanting to, to move and, and, and share. I don't know. It's, I think it, de it depends on community. It depends on people. It depends on which group. Um, not all Africans are, of course, not identical. So you have different ethnic relationships. It may be language, that may be a barrier. It may be certain cultural prescriptions and so on. But I think one has to find often ways to, to circumvent uh, those connections. Um, often one works towards it. I don't know what else to recommend in this case, except finding avenues for similarities or communication possibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question maybe. Uh, the audience asks, what does a pan-Africanist rather than an African-American approach yield for community development um, oh. to, pre to prevent a divide and conquer approach via wow. systemic powers? It provides uh, at least a theoretical model that many people in our past have used effectively. Um, so if we just go back to the attempts that um, you and I via Marcus Garvey, Amy Ashford Garvey, and Amy Jakes Garvey did to really create a movement, we see that as operating and being able to move populations, if not physically, but emotionally and culturally, right? Um, and then we see a, a variety of other versions of those taking place via W. B. Du Bois, via uh, a number of other actors and so on, and then the generations uh, that, that followed. So the, I think Pan-Africanism provides a theoretical model, which we are saying, um, uh, following the development of that new museum in Ghana and the work that will come out of that, that it provides a model that allows us to go back into it and look at what utility it has um, as a as a theoretical economic um, model. So um, Mia Motley um, and the Nana Kofuado in Ghana um, created a, a, an ability to have communications that went um, from the Caribbean to Ghana, West Africa without going through Europe. And I mentioned this earlier in a talk I did on Paula Marshall that Marshall had actually talked about this in The Chosen Place of Timeless People as a possibility using a character, Merle, who does this, right? So I think we have the, the, the spiritual, physical, 
and other kind of emotive ways of thinking about community and return, but we also have theoretical and, and political models from a variety of actors. And many of them, some of them made mistakes um, as they did. We look, we should be looking at what works. Um, in one of the courses that I teach, I look at the intersections of Pan-Africanism and, and feminism, the ways that, for example, women like Amy Ashwood Gabby named herself as a feminist um, deliberately, um, and, and the ways in which she was able to subsequently even following the movement uh, that she was involved in with Gabi to really then create a kind of other kind of global movement uh, on the continent in London, but also throughout the Caribbean launching, as my colleague Rhoda Redock would argue, a second wave of sort of Caribbean feminist activism as well. So we, we have many opportunities to study, rethink, examine, challenge, correct, um, I think really, and I said this at a conference in, in Dakar at the Museum of Black Civilizations, the weakness has been too few. I think uh, over the years, uh, there should have been many more Pan-African conferences looking at different angles so that we are not stuck with eight Pan-African conferences or how many ever they did with the logic of which one was more significant than the other, too few. There should be many more that look at different aspects of our realities. Uh, from the lens of a Pan-Africanism that allows us to, to correct, rethink, and shape, and create new models for movement. Thank you so much, Professor Davies. We worked you hard with all of these questions. Um, thank you especially for a really exciting and rich talk that I'm sure we will be going over throughout this conference, unpacking more of the ideas you've brought to us and and probably well beyond the conference as well. So thank you so much. I applaud you for your work that went into this and your labor. Um, I'm grateful too to, um, to the, the three who welcomed us with their comments at the beginning. This concludes our first session. There are um, 10 more sessions over the next three weeks. Uh, check, you can check the full symposium schedule, which is available in the chat. Um, most importantly, though, I want to remind everyone that our first panel session begins at five o'clock. So I hope you will all go grab your coffee or scone or beer and come back to us at five o'clock. Uh, this will be an exciting session uh, and a wonderful follow-up to Professor Davies' keynote address. It's titled African American slash American African Encounters, and it will feature Shia Kabona Clark, Joshua Guild, and Nancy Mirabal. So come on back and join us at five o'clock for that. Thank you again to everybody, and thank you, Professor Davies.